Welcome. Welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Uh, free thinkers, agnostics, secular humanists, person who's grappling with how to merge their spirituality with their rationality. Whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural talked about from the podium. I'd like to share with you the Seattle Atheist Creed, and um, you can see how, um, what, how it feels to you. So, Seattle Atheist Church was built on the principles, or founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds good to you, then I think you might be in the right place. And uh, the way we do it here is we, the members ourselves give the talk. So everyone is invited to give a talk. And today we have a talk um, by Jack. So without further ado. Hi everyone. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you today about Sam Harris's The Moral Landscape, uh, which not only makes the case that science can determine uh, human values, but offers a preliminary account of how. Along the way, uh, Harris covers a few related topics <coughs> uh, that would make great talks in themselves, including the incompatibility of science and religion, despite the existence of many religious scientists, and one of the recurring themes during our post-sermon discussions, free will. <coughs> I'm going to leave all of that interesting material for another time, another talk, <laughs> uh, and focus only on the core thesis of the book. Uh, the content of, of my talk borrows heavily from the book, and uh, mainly from the introduction, and from Harris's TED talk on the topic from 2010. Okay, so let's jump right in. Uh, the people of Albania have a venerable tra tradition of vendetta called Kanu. If a man commits a murder, his victim's family can kill any one of his male relatives in reprisal. If a boy has the misfortune of being the son or brother of a murderer, he must spend his days and nights in hiding, foregoing a, pro uh, a proper education, adequate health care, and the pleasures of a normal life. Untold numbers of Albanian men and boys live as prisoners of their homes even now. Is there nothing we can say about the morality of how the Albanians have structured their society? Are we obligated to pretend that their practices are morally no better or worse than those of any other culture? That they're just different? It's generally understood that questions of morality, questions of good and evil and right and wrong, are questions about which science officially has no opinion. It's thought that science can help us get what we value, but it can never tell us what we ought to value. And consequently, most people, and I expect most people here, <coughs> uh, think that science will never answer questions, uh, never answer the most important questions in human life. Questions like, what is worth living for? What is worth dying for? What constitutes a good life? It's often said that science cannot give us a foundation for morality and human values because science deals with facts, and facts and values seem to belong to different spheres. It's often thought that there's no description of the way that the world is that can tell us the way the world ought to be. In the moral landscape, Harris argues that questions about values, about meaning, morality, and life's larger purpose, are really questions about the well-being of conscious creatures. Values, therefore, translate into facts that, at least in principle, can be scientifically understood regarding positive and negative social emotions, impulses of retribution, the effects of specific laws and social institutions on human relationships, the neurophysiology of happiness and suffering, etc. While the argument Harris makes in the book is bound to be controversial, it rests on a very simple premise. Human well-being entirely depends on events in the world and on states of the human brain. Consequently, there must be scientific truths to be known about it. A more detailed understanding of these truths will force us to draw a clear distinction between different ways of living in society uh, with one another, <clears throat> judging some to be better or worse, more or less true to the facts, and more or less ethical. 
Harris isn't suggesting that we are guaranteed to resolve every moral controversy through science. Differences of opinion will remain, but opinions will be increasingly constrained by facts. And it's important to realize that our inability to answer uh, a question says nothing about whether or not the question has an answer. Exactly how many people were bitten by mosquitoes in the last 60 seconds? How many of these people will contract malaria? How many will die as a result? Given the technical challenges involved, no team of scientists could possibly respond to such questions. And yet we know that they admit of simple numerical answers. Does our inability to <coughs> uh, gather the relevant data oblige us to respect all opinions equally? Of course not. In the same way, the fact that we may uh, not be able to resolve specific moral dilemmas does not suggest that all competing responses to them are equally valid. Mistaking no answers in practice for no answers in principle is a great source of moral confusion. There are, for instance, 21 states at the time of Harris's writing that still allow corporal punishment in their schools. These are places where it is actually legal for a teacher to beat a child with a wooden board hard enough to raise large bruises and even to break the skin. Hundreds of thousands of children are subjected to this violence each year, almost exclusively in the South. The rationale for this behavior is explicitly religious, for the creator of the universe himself has told us not to spare the rod, lest we spoil the child. <clears throat> Notice the consequentialism here, uh, lest we spoil the child. In order to avoid raising a spoiled brat, the scriptures tell us that we must not refrain from beating them with a rod. If we are actually concerned about human well-being and we want to treat children in such a way uh, as to promote it, as it seems that we do, uh, we might wonder whether it is generally wise to subject little boys and girls to pain, terror, and public humiliation as a means of encouraging their cognitive and emotional development. <laughs> is there any doubt that this question has an answer? Is there any doubt that it matters that we get it right? Spoiler alert, all the research indicates that corporal punishment is a disastrous practice leading to more violence and social pathology, and perversely, to greater support for corporal punishment. <clears throat> the deeper point here is that there simply must be answers to questions of this kind, whether we know them or not. <clears throat> and these are not areas where we can afford to simply respect the traditions of others and agree to disagree. Why will science increasingly decide uh, such questions? Because the varying and conflicting answers that people give to them, along with the consequences that follow in terms of human relationships, states of mind, acts of violence, entang entanglements with the law, etc., translate into differences in our brains, in the brains of others, and in the world at large. When talking about value, we are actually talking about an interdependent world of facts. There are facts to be understood about how thoughts and intentions arise in the human brain. There are facts to be learned about how these mental states translate into behavior. And there are further facts to be known about how these behaviors influence the world and the experience of other conscious beings. Facts of this sort exhaust everything we can reasonably mean by the terms good and evil. They will increasingly fall within the purview of science and run far deeper than a person's religious affiliation. Just as there is no such thing as Christian physics, it's just physics, or Muslim algebra, it's just algebra, we will see that there is no such thing as Christian or Muslim morality. Indeed, Harris argues, morality should be considered an underdeveloped branch of science. Just a quick aside, <clears throat> this is in keeping with a post on the blog, uh, Common, Sense, Common Sense Atheism, called the goal, of philosophy, me, the goal of philosophy should be to kill itself. That post argues that for millennia, uh, philosophy has been the study of questions for which we don't really know how to get the answers. Once we know how to get the answers about a set of questions, we start calling the set of questions a science. 
We stopped philosophizing about the heavens when we invented the telescope and started doing astronomy. We stopped philosophizing about biology when Mendel and Darwin and others discovered how to rigorous, rigorously test biological theories against experience. If Harris is right about a couple of things here, he's giving us the beginning of, uh, of a framework to pursue answers to questions in the philosophy of ethics in a systematic way. Throughout the book, uh, Harris makes reference to a hypothetical space he calls the moral landscape, a space of real and potential outcomes whose peaks correspond to the heights of potential well-being and whose valleys uh, represent the deepest possible suffering. Different ways of thinking and behaving, different cultural practices, ethical codes, modes of government, etc., will translate into movements across this landscape and therefore into different degrees of human flourishing. He's not suggesting that we will necessarily discover one right answer to every moral question or a single best way for human beings to live. Some questions may admit of many answers, each more or less equivalent. However, the existence of multiple peaks on the moral landscape does not make them any less real <clears throat> or any less worthy of discovery. Nor would it make a difference between, uh, nor would it make the difference between being stuck on a peak and being stuck in a valley any less clear or consequential. Now, why wouldn't this undermine uh, objective morality? Well, think of the way that we talk about food. Harris says that he would never be tempted to argue to you that there must be one right food to eat. There's clearly a range of materials that constitute healthy food. But there's never, nevertheless an objective difference between food and poison. Each different uh, people's reactions to different substances some people will die if they eat peanuts, for example, it doesn't undermine this objectivity because we can account for these differences within the context of a rational discussion about chemistry, biology, and human health. Even people's varying preferences, an archetypal example of subjectivity, does not undermine this objectivity because these differences amount to differences in the brain, differences that are objective facts about the universe. Science could, in principle, account for why some people prefer chocolate ice cream over vanilla, and why no one's favorite flavor is aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that there are many right answers to the question, what is food, does not tempt us to say that there are no truths to be known about human nutrition, or that all culinary styles must be equally healthy in principle. There are questions where the, uh, there, there could be situations where the question of which course of action uh, might maximize well-being has no determinate answer and not merely because well-being is difficult to measure in practice but because there's some room for rational disagreement about exactly what it is. If it's shorthand for the summation of various even deeper values there could be room for legitimate disagreement about what those values are and, and certainly about how they should be weighted. But if that is so there could end up being legitimate disagreement on what is to be done with no answer that is objectively binding on all the disagreeing parties. Doesn't this undermine well-being as a basis for objective morality? Well, couldn't the same be said about human health? What if there were, uh, what if there are trade-offs with respect to human performance that we can't get around? What if, for instance, an ability to jump high always comes at a cost of flexibility? Will there be disagreements between orthopedists who specialize in basketball and those who specialize in yoga? Sure. So what? We will still be talking about very small deviations from a common standard of health, one that certainly does not include a raging case of smallpox. <laughs> Movement across the moral landscape can be analyzed on many levels, ranging from biochemistry to economics. <clears throat> but where human beings are concerned, change will necessarily depend upon states and capacities of the human brain. Uh, sorry, my self word on the fritz here, one sec. <laughs> um, okay. The relevant neuroscience is in its infancy, but we know that our emotions, social interactions, and moral intuitions mutually influence one another. We grow attuned to our fellow human beings through these systems, <coughs> creating culture in the process. Culture becomes a mechanism for further social, emotional, and moral development. 
There's simply no doubt that the human brain is the nexus of these influences. Cultural norms influence our thinking and behavior by altering the structure and function of our brains. Do you feel that sons are more desirable than daughters? Is obedience to parental authority more important than honest inquiry? Would you cease to love your child if you learned that he or she is gay? The ways parents view such questions and the subsequent effects in the lives of their children must translate into facts about their brains. Harris's goal is to convince us that human knowledge and human values can no longer be kept apart. The world of measurement and the world of meaning must eventually be reconciled. Harris wants to be very clear about his general thesis. He's not suggesting that science can give us an evolutionary or neurobiological account of what people uh, do in the name of morality. Nor is he merely saying that science uh, can help us get what we want out of life. These would be quite uh, banal claims to make, unless one happens to doubt the truth of evolution, the mind's dependency on the brain, or the general utility of science. Rather, he's arguing that science can, in principle, help us understand what we should do and what we should want and therefore what other people should do and should want in order to live the best lives possible. His claim is that there are right and wrong answers to moral questions, just as there are right and wrong answers to questions of physics. And such answers may one day fall within the reach of maturing sciences of the mind. Once we see that a concern for well-being Defined as, defined as deeply and as inclusively as possible, is the only intelligible basis for morality and values, we will see that there must be a science of morality, whether or not we ever succeed in developing it. Because the well-being of conscious creatures depends on how the universe is altogether. Given the changes in the physical universe and in our experience of it, uh, given that these changes can be understood, uh, science should increasingly, increasingly enable us to answer specific moral questions. For instance, would it be better to spend our next billion dollars eradicating racism or malaria? Which is generally more harmful to our personal relationships, white lies or gossip? Such questions may seem impossible to get a hold of at this moment, but they may not stay that way forever. As we, continue to under, as we come to understand how human beings can best collaborate and thrive in this world, Science can help us find a path leading away from the lowest depths of misery and toward the heights of happiness for the greatest number of people. Of course, there will be practical impediments to evaluating the consequences of certain actions, and different paths through, through life may be morally equivalent. There may be more than one peak on the moral landscape. But Harris is arguing that these are no obstacles in principle to our speaking about moral truth. As with all matters of fact, differences of opinion on moral questions merely reveal the incompleteness of our knowledge. They do not oblige us to respect the diversity of views indefinitely. Everyone has an intuitive physics. Much of our intuitive physics is wrong with respect to the goal of describing the behavior of matter. Harris is arguing that everyone also has an intuitive morality, but much of our intuitive morality is wrong with respect to the goal of maximizing personal and collective well-being. The framework of the moral landscape guarantees that many people will have flawed conceptions of morality, just as many people have flawed conceptions of physics. Some people think physics includes or validates practices like astrology, voodoo, and homeopathy. These people are, by all appearances, simply wrong about physics. In the United States, <clears throat> the majority of people, 57% uh, when the book was published, believe that preventing homosexuals from marrying is a moral imperative. However, if this belief rests on a flawed sense of how we can maximize our well-being, such people may simply be wrong about morality. Clearly, people can adopt a form of life that needlessly undermines their physical health. Similarly, it should be no surprise that people might undermine their own psychological well-being, or that their social institutions could become engines of pointless cruelty, despair, or superstition. Why is it even slightly controversial to imagine that a culture could harbor beliefs about reality that are not only false, but demonstrably harmful. Every society that has ever existed has had to channel and subdue certain aspects of human nature. Envy, territorial violence, avarice, deceit, laziness, cheating, 
etc. Through mechanisms, uh, through so social mechanisms and institutions. It would be a miracle if all these societies, irrespective of their size, geographical location, their place in history, and the genomes of their members, had done this equally well. And yet the prevailing bias of cultural relativism assumes that such a miracle has occurred not just once, but always. <laughs> Moral relativism is clearly an attempt to pay intellectual reparations for the crimes of Western colonialism, ethnocentrism, and racism. This is, Sam Harris, uh, Sam Harris thinks, and I tend to agree, the only charitable thing that can be said about it. He wants to be absolutely clear <clears throat> that he's not defending the idiosyncrasies of the West as any more enlightened in principle than those of any other culture. Rather, he's arguing that the most basic facts about human flourishing must transcend culture, just as other facts do. And if there are facts that <clears throat> are truly a matter of cultural construction, if, for instance, learning a specific language or tattooing your face in a certain way, fundamentally alters the possibilities of human experience, well, these, are fa these facts arise also from neuro neurophysiological processes that transcend culture. There are very practical concerns that follow from the glib idea that anyone is free to value anything. The most consequential being that it is precisely what allows highly educated, secular, and otherwise well-intentioned people to pause thoughtfully and often interminably before condemning practices like compulsory, uh, compulsory veiling, genital mutilation, bride burning, forced marriage, <coughs> and the other cheerful products of alternative morality found elsewhere in the world. Fanciers of Hume's is ought distinction never seem to realize what the stakes are, and they do not see how abject failures of compassion are enabled by this intellectual intolerance of moral difference. While much of the debate <coughs> on these issues must be had in academic terms, this is not merely an academic debate. There are girls getting their faces burned off with acid at this moment who are daring to learn to read or for not consenting to marry men they have never met or even for the crime of getting raped. We have good reason to believe that certain cultures are less suited to maximizing well-being than others. One phrase I've come across that describes this phenomenon is the lupus in liberalism. I want to elaborate on that for just a moment using a blog post by Daniel uh, Meisler. The most dangerous aspect of the extreme left <clears throat> is that it functions as an immune disorder. Immune systems are generally good for us. They see threats and they mobilize attacks against them. That's positive. Immune disorders, however, are quite nasty. Allergies, for example, are basically hyperactive immune systems that cause the body to panic over things like pollen and dander. On the extreme side, <clears throat> lupus is a disease that turns the immune system's weapons against one's own body. And that's what's happening with many liberals today. Extreme liberalism has become infected with a lupus of ideas that causes progressives to attack others for being progressive. Here's how liberal lupus works. One, liberalism protects humanism and tolerance. Two, religion X supports the tolerance Y. Three, humanist Z criticizes that intolerant behavior. Four, confused liberals attack humanist Z for being intolerant. Healthy liberalism is supposed to protect against intolerance and racism, so it rightly protects against people hating someone just because they're from one religion or another. But when someone claims that their religion gives them permission to violate humanism or tolerance, the immune system, <coughs> liberalism, becomes confused. The belief is clearly intolerance itself, but because it's shielded, shielded in a belief system, liberals are trained to protect it. So when a humanist attacks a specific intolerant belief, and by proxy, the religion that holds it, the infected liberals turn on the humanist instead of supporting their humanist position, because that would mean criticizing the religion. Acceptance of any behavior at all without regard for how counter it runs to humanist concepts does not make one tolerant. It makes one confused about what it means to be liberal in the first place. Majid Nawaz, <coughs> who co-authored another book with Sam Harris uh, called Islam and the Future of Tolerance, talks about this a lot. One example comes from his Big Think video called Je suis Muslim, 
uh, which he put out after the Islamist terrorist attack against the French satirical newspaper, Charlie Hebdo. It's what he calls the bigotry of low expectations. To lower those standards when looking at a brown person, of a brown, uh, if a brown person happens to express a level of misogyny, chauvinism, bigotry, or anti-Semitism, and yet hold other white people to universal liberal standards. The real victim of that double standard are the minority communities themselves, because by doing so, we limit their horizons. We limit their own ceiling uh, and expectations as to what they aspire to be. We're judging them as somehow uh, that their culture is inherently less civilized. And of course, we're tolerating bigotry within communities. And the first victims of that bigotry happen to be those who are the weakest inside those minority communities. There's no denying, of course, <clears throat> that the effort to reduce all human values to biology can lead to some rather glaring mistakes. For instance, the entomologist E.O. Wilson, in collaboration with the philosopher Michael Ruse, uh, wrote that morality, or more strictly, <clears throat> our belief in morality, is merely an adaptation put in place to further our reproductive ends. The philosopher Daniel Dennett rightly dismissed that as nonsense. The fact that our moral intuitions probably conferred some adaptive advantage upon our ancestors does not mean that the present purpose of morality is successful reproduction, or that our belief in morality is just a useful delusion. Nor does it mean that our notion of morality cannot grow deeper and more refined as our own understanding of ourselves develops. We have good reason to believe that much of what we do in the name, name of morality, like decrying sexual infidelity, punishing cheaters, valuing cooperation, is born of uh, unconscious processes that were shared by natural selection. But this does not mean that evolution designed us to lead deeply fulfilling lives. In talking about a science of morality, uh, Harris is not referring to an evolutionary account <clears throat> of all the cognitive and emotional processes that govern what people do when they say that they're being moral. He's referring to the totality of the scientific facts that govern the range of conscious experiences that are possible for us. To say that there are truths about morality and about morality and human values is simply to say that there are facts about well-being uh, well that await our discovery, regardless of our evolutionary history. Harris outlines three projects here that are distinct and often conflated. We should avoid conf conflating them. <clears throat> one, project one. We can explain why people tend to follow certain patterns of thought and behavior, many of them demonstrably silly and harmful, in the name of morality. Project two, we can think more clearly about the nature of moral truth and determine which patterns of thought and behavior we should follow in the name of morality. In project three, we can convince people who are committed to silly and harmful patterns of thought and behavior in the name of morality to break these commitments and to live better lives. These are distinct and independently worthy endeavors. Most scientists who study morality in evolution, evolutionary, psychological, or neurobiological terms are exclusively devoted to the first project. Their goal is to describe and understand how people think and behave in light of morally salient emotions like anger, disgust, empathy, love, guilt, humiliation, etc. This research is fascinating, of course, but it's not Harris's focus. And while our common evolutionary origins and resultant physiological similarities to one another suggest that human well-being will admit of general principles that can be scientifically understood, Harris considers this first project to be all but irrelevant to projects two and three. Uh, in the past, he's found himself <coughs> in conflict with some of the leaders in this field because many of them, like the psychologist Jonathan Haidt, who uh, Stephen has given talks about before here in the Seattle APS Church, um, believe that this first project represents the only legitimate point of contact between science and morality. Harris has since had uh, hate on his uh, podcast discuss various disagreements, which I believe I posted a link to uh, in the private Facebook group a few months ago. Harris believes that the third project, changing people's ethical commitments, is the most important task facing humanity in the 21st century. Nearly every other important goal, from combating climate change, to fighting terrorism, to curing cancer, to saving the whales, 
falls within its purview. Of course, moral persuasion is a difficult business, but it seems especially difficult if we haven't figured out in what sense moral truths exist. Hence, Harris's main focus is on project two. It's, to see the difference between these three projects, it's best to consider some specific examples. We can, for instance, give a plausible evolutionary account of why human societies have tended to treat women as property of men. This is project one. It is, however, quite another thing to give a scientific account of whether, why, and to what degree human societies change for the better when they outgrow this tendency. This is project two. It is yet another thing altogether to decide how best to change people's attitudes at this moment in history and to empower women on a global scale. This is project three. It is easy to see why the study of the evolutionary origins of morality might lead to the conclusion that morality has nothing at all to do with capital T truth. If morality is simply an adaptive means of organizing human social behavior and mitigating conflict, there would be no reason to think <clears throat> that our current sense of right and wrong would reflect any deeper understanding about the nature of reality. Hence, a narrow focus <clears throat> on explaining why people think and behave as they do can lead, to, lead a person to find the idea of moral truth literally unintelligible. But notice that the first two projects give quite different accounts of how morality fits into the nat natural world. In project one, morality is the collection of impulses and behaviors along with their cultural expressions and neurobiological underpinnings uh, that have been hammered into us by evolution. In project two, morality refers to the impulses and behaviors we can follow so as to maximize our well-being in the future. Okay, well, I'm gonna leave it there for today. It's a lot more detail and examples, uh, of course, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Uh, if the subject matter interests you, I'd highly recommend giving this book a read through. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so let's discuss.